this video, what we're going to do is provide a click by click tutorial of how to estimate stress and displacement in a component using finite element analysis in Fusion 360. And we're going to use this component that we created in the last video. This is a I beam from our topic reading. Um, so the first thing we'll do is go up to this drop down where it says design and we'll switch over to simulation. And there are lots of options for things we could simulate in the software, uh, but we'll choose static stress. That's how we can uh, most directly calculate the stress and uh, dis deflections in our component and create a study. All right, now up along the top, you can see a set of icons that sort of define the flow of the process. Um, we've got our study. We're not gonna simplify any of the geometry in, in this case. So that leaves us materials. And um, you can see that by default, the material of this component was set to steel and we're gonna be okay with that. So um, the, uh, you know, when you're, when you're just modeling a part in, in fusion, you may not care what it's made out of when you're just trying to get the geometry right. But in order to do finite element analysis, we need to know what the material is. And the most important properties uh, for FEA are actually the um, elastic modulus and the Poisson's ratio. It's important to have these to be reasonably close to the material you use in the real component because those define how the part deforms when it's loaded. It's actually not that important to have the yield strength uh, match the material you're going to use in real life because what you can do is just look at the results of the stress analysis and compare those to the, the known strength of your material to create your own factor of safety. We're not gonna really use the factor of safety block. Okay, so we've got a material. Next step is to apply some constraints. And um, looks like we somehow selected that whole body. Let's, we don't want that. Um, this is gonna be a cantilever beam with one fixed end and one free end. So what we'd like to do is look at that left-hand face and fix it. So I'm gonna click on that and you see this padlock icon pops up and that's telling us that uh, this entire face won't be able to move in any direction. And this is uh, the most common constraint that we can apply. There, there are a bunch that, and we'll discuss some of those in future videos. All right, so we've now got a constraint applied here. Uh, we can now move on to our loads. And if we click on loads, again, we'll see a drop down with several choices. The most common uh, load to apply is a simple force. We'll use that and zoom in on the free end of the I-beam, click on that face, and you can see these blue arrows pop up indicating the kind of force that would be applied. Now these arrows, uh, aren't in the direction we like. They are, they are tending to compress that I-beam where we want to put it in cantilever bending. So uh, we're gonna come down here to direction type and choose vectors instead of uh, normal, which is the default. And what we want here is negative 5,000 pound force in uh, the Z direction. And you can see the arrow has changed directions and everything looks okay. So we're gonna say, okay. If we zoom back to look at our IB, we can see now how we have uh, the constraints and loading set up. These are some of the biggest choices we make. So uh, next thing in our, in our list would be contacts. This is a, a single component analysis. So there aren't any contacts between components. We can skip that. And um, then we can, uh, uh, you could just go straight to solve, but I'd like to take a look at what the mesh is. So I'm gonna click toggle mesh visibility and it's gonna prompt me to create a mesh. Now, when we perform finite element analysis, uh, what's happening is we take this solid continuous body and we approximate it as a whole bunch of little um, links and nodes. And so this whole thing becomes really similar to a truss problem, like the ones that you studied in the statics class. So if we look at this mesh, each one of these little lines is like a link and this little intersection points where links connect is a node. And uh, we know from statics, each link is a two force member so we know the line of action of each force. And then the sum of the forces at each node from all the intersecting links uh, or external forces has to be zero. 
And so this becomes a statically determinate problem with lots and lots of equations that are coupled, uh, but technically you could do it by hand. Uh, anyways, these are pretty easy to solve with linear algebra tools in modern computers. So when we um, previously set this, uh, this surface to be fixed, what we were really doing is saying each of the nodes on the surface can't move. And so the solver will figure out what force would be needed at each of those nodes to keep it from moving despite the forces from all these links that will be uh, applied to it. And similarly, when we uh, applied that uh, force to the other end of the I-beam, sorry, my 360 scrolling, sometimes perfect. Um, what we're really saying is this force will be broken up and uh, distributed over all the nodes on this face and added into that force balance for those nodes. Okay, so uh, we've now got our problem set up sufficiently to solve it. We'll come over to solve. And we can see uh, you have two options for solving. You can go on the cloud or locally. For small problems like this, I prefer to do it locally. And you can click solve. It's, if it's the first time solving a simulation with uh, 360, you may get prompted to install the, the software, that's okay. Now what's happening in the background is that big free body diagram problem is being solved and it's figuring out what's the force in each of those links. And uh, depending on the area that each link is responsible for, it can map that into a stress in the component. And then similarly, it's figuring out if that was the force on each link, you know, how much would that link uh, uh, stretch? And that can be mapped back into um, a strain and then uh, accumulated to give you the overall deformation of the part. So our, our solver is finished. We get a couple of dialogues that pop up. Okay, this is just saying we're done. And this is saying, oh no, the factor is too slow, but we, we don't really care. We're, we're gonna calculate our own. And the, the default thing, the first view that pops up here is uh, safety factor. Again, I find this to be not a very helpful uh, thing to look at as a designer. It really truncates uh, coarsens the information. So let's go to stress. And the first thing to do when you start looking at the results of a finite element analysis is to, to look at them qualitatively and interpret whether they make sense to make sure you've got your constraints and loads uh, chosen well. So let's look at this thing from the side. And what we'll see right away is um, it has that characteristic shape of a cantilever beam. This face hasn't moved as we desired. This other end has displaced. The whole thing has bent a bit and it's more bendy over here than it is over here. So that all looks pretty good. Um, if we look at the stresses, they also meet our expectations from our simple models. So we thought that a bending stress would dominate. And over here, the bending stress is gonna be small because the moment is small. There's very little lever arm from this force. And indeed, uh, this blue color indicates stress is low. If we look over at the other end, we see that the stresses are higher uh, because the bending moment is higher from that. That, that force has a bigger moment arm. If we uh, zoom in even closer, we'll see that the stresses near the centroid are low uh, because the distance to the centroid is, is small. That y in our my over i canonical formula and that at the top and bottom surfaces, the stresses are higher because you're farther from the centroid. And then finally, if we uh, zoom in on this uh, region around the holes, we'll see that um, exactly as we'd expected, uh, the holes are stress concentrators and those lines of force have to uh, move their way around them. They get bunched up and the stress, the peak stress is higher near the edges of those holes than in the main part of the flange. Okay, so everything looks good qualitatively. And so we have good match between our detailed stress analysis and our simplified stress analysis. So let's start look at things quantitatively. Um, over here, we have this map that tells us uh, what each color means in terms of stress. Um, we're looking at stress, we've got the von Mises equivalent stress, which is what we want to compare to our yield stress in this case, as we discussed in the topic reading. Uh, we're going to change the units to PSI so that we can better compare to our hand calculations. And what we see is uh, this green region here 
has uh, a stress around 20,000 PSI or 20 KSI, which is almost exactly what we calculated by hand uh, for our beam without accounting for the stress concentration. So success, that's great. Um, if we look at the peak stress, which is happening on the uh, outside edges of these holes, uh, we see it's about 46 KSI. And that's pretty close to the 54 KSI that we calculated. But there, there are some things I'm a little bit uh, nervous about here. Uh, it looks like uh, when, we, when we checked our mesh, there weren't many nodes or links around here, but the stress is changing. Uh, it's a big change over a, a very short distance. So the stress is very low on this end, edge of the hole. It's very high uh, on, on that edge of the hole. It really goes from min to max uh, over a, a short distance. So in order to be able to better estimate the stress right around the hole, we might want a, uh, a more refined mesh. So we're gonna click out of these results and then go to manage settings and go to our mesh and, and let's um, reduce our average element size down from 10% to let's say 3%. And then we'll also um, use an adaptive mesh refinement. So we're gonna bring this up to high. You really have to push on it to get this thing to give you accurate results. Uh, and what that's gonna do is uh, it will run the FEA simulation once and then look where stress is changing quickly over adjacent nodes and then it will add nodes in that region and rerun the simulation until it gets sufficient accuracy. We we'll say okay. And then we'll also add a local mesh control because we know that we want a really fine uh, mesh on these holes. So I'll click both of those holes. We could do the same thing for, for other holes if we wanted, but let's just keep it here for now. And we'll set this to be as fine as we can. And you can see we're getting a, a, a very small um, link size there. Okay. So now that we've got those set, we can uh, rerun the simulation. And we'll do this locally again, we'll solve. Um, this can take a minute. So I'm just gonna pause the recording and jump back with you when this is finished. About one minute, and that illustrates the, this trade-off between the accuracy of the results and the computational time required. Usually it's best to start out fast and inaccurate and gradually uh, refine as you go along in the design process. You can learn a lot from a fast, um, inaccurate uh, FEA. Okay, so we're gonna close these dialogues. And now if we look at the, the pattern of stress around these holes, we can see, oh yes, this is, there's, a, there's much more uh, detail here. You know, the resolution looks like it's quite a bit higher. And here we're getting a peak stress of about 55 KSI, which is almost exactly what we found when we uh, did our hand calculations. Okay, so that's how we, uh, we can run uh, FEA and analyze the stress results. There's one other thing we might wanna look at, which is displacement. So in some cases, we'll be interested in the, the total displacement of some portion of our design. And if we switch from stress here to the displacement chart, we can see uh, the overall pattern here, the part that's fixed on, on the, the fixed end of the cantilever beam hasn't moved and, and it's got this uh, blue value. Over on the other end, the free end, it has moved as we expected. And the total displacement is about uh, 10 millimeters or one centimeter. And that's indicated here. Okay, so that is a quick uh, description of how we can run a finite element analysis uh, of stress and displacement and interpret it in Fusion 360.